I grew up as a musician playing classical piano, jazz saxophone, rock guitar. Um, I played in bands my whole life. And as a student, I, I studied, I did study music, but I, I really got interested in studying music and technology from an early age. And looking at how in the you know, early 90s, how computer systems could be used to manipulate sound and music. Mm -hmm. And so when I did get to study music and technology in college, I got to play on these incredible systems, these, these computer systems that filled rooms. The, mm -hmm. the Synclavier is a, is a great example at Dartmouth College. What, what that gave me was, was the bug, and I got really excited about, wow, isn't this incredible what we can do with these computer systems that I had learned about but didn't really see an, an avenue forward for me in what I was interested in. What's the advantage of looking at music and music making in particular from a tech standpoint? Like, what kind of advantage does that give us? Well, sound is such an interesting thing. It's, it's you know, a physical phenomenon that exists all around us. Um, and as musicians, we learn how to take these boxes of wood and string and steel and control sound in, in intricate ways that take thousands of hours of practice. Technology allows us to then take that learned behavior, those skills, and manipulate them further in ways that as, as, as musicians, we could only dream of in the past. So technology lets me take music that I may create or someone else may create and transform it into something entirely new. Oh, that's really cool. I mean, I, I'm kind of thinking about the music you've created and I've listened to some of it and I've seen some of your score sheets too. And they're just absolutely incredible things to look at. But even thinking about your music, it's interesting because I think when a lot of people think of music, they think of like a, maybe a four minute song with a melody and a chorus, maybe a bridge. Um, when I've listened to the music you've created with trained musicians, for in my ears at least, it sounds quite abstract. Am I correct in, in thinking that these pieces like don't have a beginning, middle, or end, or is there a certain structure to the works you create? Musical structure is a really interesting thing, and, and we as a society, and as many societies around the world, have gotten used to certain structures, whether it's the three-minute blast of pop punk for perfection, or a sonata form, or you know, a large orchestral work. And that's by no means the only way that music has ever been or is structured, especially if we look at cultures all around the world mm -hmm. where music is, is essentially treated as sound with organization, organized sound is a phrase that was popularized by composer Edgar Varese. When we're talking about the kind of music that I enjoy creating with technology, it does have structure, and I do approach it as a composer, where I'm actually planning an arc. But that arc might not be three minutes. It might not be six minutes. It might be 12 or 40. And along that way, I, I create these divisions and subdivisions of, of sound and pattern in ways that, to me, reflect some kind of meaning. You brought up time, and I think this is so interesting because with, with COVID and everything and everyone now, like even people who are traditionally not using tech to work are now using tech. They're communicating with people literally on the other side of the world. And I know that time is important for you because you are, if I understand correctly, you're trying to help musicians be able to say, create some type of virtual orchestra or virtual band piece together with people across the world and there's no time lag. Am I correct about that? Absolutely. And and so one thing that I think all of us have understood and learned to understand in the last two years is that communication with people around the world is possible, and yet that distance is, we can hear it. We hear it in our communications. Latency or time is super important in music, right? If we're playing music together and we're not in sync, right. it's hard for us to hear one another, whether right. we're playing rhythmic music or something more abstract. Even by a fraction of a second, it can, it can ruin the whole entire piece. So the idea of us being able to hear one another in time is super important. And there's been wonderful research that's gone on over the last 20 years, 30 years, about how music and sound can be communicated across networks. Foundational work at Stanford by my advisor, Chris Chafe, at the lab at which I, I did my studies, um, in understanding how these latencies affect the way we play music together, but also building technologies that allow us to minimize that latency, to cut down the amount of time that it takes for my signal right. to go around the world and get to you, and then for your signal to come back to me. Right, and that means that, for instance, if I wanted to, if I wanted to play guitar and then sync that up with someone playing drums in Japan, we can actually now do that properly because there isn't that fraction of a second it's off. It's completely synchronous in the 
truest sense. Well, the challenge is that there will always be some kind of fraction of a second because mm. the, that information is traveling at the speed of light. Got it. Now, okay. at, at, at its best, it's the speed of light. And in reality, it has to pass through wires and boxes and cables all around the world. So there are so many different strategies that we look at as researchers trying to create systems that allow us to do exactly what you said. When I'm working with VR instruments, it's a, a whole nother related set of challenges because these systems are modeled after video game systems. Right, so these are virtual instruments. It's like they're computer created animated instruments, but they function, like they actually work. Like if you have, I think I've seen videos of like people have, will have a device on their hand and then they'll strum and it actually strums the virtual instrument. Absolutely, and so in this case, I've been building a whole series of instruments we call quartet, C-O-R-E-T-E-T, -E -T, where the virtual instruments are computer constructs floating in space that we see through these virtual reality goggles, something like, oh, that's so great. like an Oculus Rift. This is a, a pair of stereoscopic lenses that create kind of the illusion in our brains that we're seeing something with depth and, and something in their, and the, uh, the concept of space. And so in that sense, it allows us to build objects in virtual space that we can reach out and move and grab and reach around and for the recent work I've been doing, or the recent things I've been playing with, is about how to create stringed instruments, bowed cellos and violins and basses, in which we can reach into that virtual space and play them, and that information not only comes out as sound, but is also sent out to the people with whom we're playing, ideally around the world. Virtual reality is also starting to play a really big role on a larger sense in larger realms of media and entertainment. So for instance, I mean, Ariana Grande, for instance, just had a big live concert via Fortnite. And that's not the first time that the game, online game Fortnite's had virtual concerts. So I'm curious to know, Rob, what is the future of music and maybe music with virtual reality like moving, say, 10 years from now? Such a great question. Um, there are so, I, the way I like to think about it is, is there are going to be a lot of futures. Um, one of them, which is directly related to what you're talking about, and the idea of maybe using gaming platforms and interactive media as ways to present music, musical concerts, is that a whole generation is growing up right now who are more attuned towards media experiences with which they can interact. They're no longer passive consumers sitting on the couch watching a television, mm -hmm. they're at a minimum chatting on a feed while watching a video, while on Discord, while playing a game. So the idea of interacting with their media, with our media, has become extremely popular over the last, last decade. Moving forward into the future, I, I can only see that, you know, once the, 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 the cat's out of the bag, we're not going back, right? We're, we're not going to go back to passive forms of entertainment to the same extent when we can interact with, with the world, when we can watch concerts while walking around a fantastical space and seeing a 400 foot avatar of, of our favorite performer. Right. Um, it's, Ariana it's, Grande at 400 feet tall. Exactly. <laughs> She's like four and, feet tall. <laughs> and it, it, it's, it's such an interesting and, and fascinating way to engage content. And, and that's what I think is, is such a, a, a wonderful way that Technology is changing the landscape when we look at music and entertainment and, and you know, all these things that we as, as avid consumers of music and sound and video really, really want. That's amazing. Well, Rob, thank you so much for being on A House Farts. It was so great learning about this and seeing that virtual reality <laughs> of goggles. Well, thanks so much for having me. It was great me. having you. Yeah, thanks.